everybody and welcome along to another episode of Film Franchise Fortnite on the Cold Pops Podcast. I am one of your hosts. I'm the uglier host, AJ, and I'm joined here by by AJ. the most attractive man in the world. <laughs> Over over correcting. God, <laughs> well, now I've got this whole thing to live up to. Mm. Well, not really. It's an audio medium, so you actually never have to yeah, deliver I... on what I've set you up. Yeah. Attract you're right. Attractiveness is actually part of a personality, not just a visual. Yeah, I think You're right, Richard. I think I'm <laughs> I, I think I my I'm ugly as a, just as a person. Mm, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, personalities yeah, can much be Much like the characters we're talking about today. We are. So this is a podcast if you're new. What an episode to pick, I guess. Um, yeah. I wonder how many podcasts are about this series because it's kind of one of these... This is So usually we cover a film franchise each episode on this show. This year specifically, we're only doing two film franchises. So franchises with two films in it. We're not just covering two separate franchises. Yes. Um, and if you're and new here, you'll find that funny. If you are one of our classic fans, you've heard that before. You've heard that before. Um, <laughs> and I think that like... This is a franchise, and I'll reveal all for those who haven't read the title. Um, this is a franchise which is less a situation where, like, you'd call it a franchise and more like there's a movie, and then they made a sequel to that movie, and in this case, much later. For so for so we're talking about train spotting, and for so long, train spotting was like the single thing, you know, and it built its own 20, legacy for 20 years. and like 20 years exactly build its own like cult around it just being a single thing and now we're here to be like yeah well a sequel came out uh 19 years later so therefore it's a franchise and it is, is it now in our domain later? 20 you're right i always do that i always mix up you know because like, well one, it's one off being 20 yeah <laughs> yeah 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 no legit that's legit what's happening because no, my no, maths my maths, Richard, is so juvenile. My ability to calculate is so broken that I see train spotting 1996 and T2 train spotting 2017. I look at the six, I look at the seven, and I know that if it was 1997 and 2017, that that's 20 years. But throw me one but number off, and I have no idea which side of 20 <laughs> I'm on. Um. Well, I mean, it's interesting you say that, and I'm sure this will come up later, but, like, you once called uh, The Shawshank Redemption a film franchise because it's based on a book. Sometimes, and Richard, you, you say you once did this or you famously did this. It's about something I mentioned to you once at, like, in your house, not, like, not publicly. I didn't release a statement saying The Shawshank Redemption okay, well, is a franchise. You said it on a podcast, so it is out there. And two... I, I feel like you wanted to come at me for my my use of the word famously, and then as you launched your attack, you realized I didn't say famously this time. <laughs> so you, you, but you still came at it with the same venom, and then had to mm. clarify. Sometimes you say this as well, but no, I mean you you did say that once famously, and <laughs> the but the thing is that train spotting is it's based on a book, and mm. that book has I believe three sequels. Yeah, well, one. So it is a franchise. Is is that yeah. what you're? Is that well, what yeah, you're but saying? but well, you because I mean, just the way you said that, it's like oh, it existed as this single thing for a long time. That it's like well, you, you know, that's not quite not not entirely true, Ellen. That like I, I I really no like let's let's move on from trying to um make each other look as stupid as possible and actually turn this into a well you haven't that- I don't you haven't I don't think you've dented my intelligence in the <laughs> you're still doing it Richard you're still doing it I said, let's move on um, like I think that um this researching this franchise it, it was really interesting so so train spotting as you say it's based on a book by a guy named Irvin Welsh whose entire career is these like depraved scottish filth novels i believe he's actually written a novel called filth that was made into yes. a james mcavoy film um and like the the i, I don't know like i had a, I, I i was thinking about it while researching this because like he wrote the sequels to the train spotting novel 
you know, in this interim between the second yeah. the second movie coming out, and, yeah, the, and I this, think one of them the first sequel came out like two thousand two or something like that. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And I think the most recent one is post. Yeah, it's post T two. Yeah. But like, imagine what it's like to. And I'm not even saying like this from the perspective of like having your art taken away from you or anything, but like. We as movie consumers more than book readers, we go train spotting is Danny Boyle. That's the director. It's his thing, right? It, it mm. made his career. It put him on the map. Train spotting is Danny Boyle's thing. And so therefore when he returns to direct train spotting two T2 train spotting, you go mm. like, yeah, it's Danny Boyle's story. It's Danny Boyle's train spotting. And I, I do wonder what it's like for someone like Irvin Welsh. Who's like, well, these characters existed like i created these characters their stories existed in my heart probably in some form for like a decade before the movie was even made right mm. um i think i think the book was written in three years before the film but you know how long does a book take to write how long's a piece of string richard richard how many roads mr man walk down <laughs> these are the questions that we we are uh, uh lay awake at night pondering um and I think like it's it's just interesting because, uh, yeah, this is a, the these are stories about a set group of characters, and for the most famous, probably most well known version of these characters, is from someone else. But like you would, as the author, it is your right, and it probably feels like it is you are the 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 holder of the keys to continuing the the story in whatever way you see fit um and maybe maybe richard for book readers um you know if if we were a podcast about books maybe like that would be our perspective but yeah we're we're not we're about movies so we fuck the books that's the that's the podcast motto mm. fuck the books yeah, yeah. so uh train spotting one came out in 1996 directed as i said by danny boyle uh do you know what it has on ron tomatoes uh, I don't actually. Uh, I would guess quite. I mean, the subject matter I imagine would be quite off-putting for some people, uh, but it's also considered one of like the great British films. Mm. So I would guess around hovering around ninety. It's exactly ninety. You've done it again. Oh well. <laughs> I wish you. I wish you'd get it wrong just so I could have a different like yes and to what you say, because yeah. every time now I'm just like, oh, you get it right every time, or I'm convinced you're cheating. Like I'm running out of clever ways to be like, I'm astonished that you guessed one <laughs> number out of a hundred correctly. Um, yeah. And yeah, that what you said just then, off-putting material. Good point. A little content warning for this episode. We will be discussing some of the events that happen in these movies. That includes. Uh, Drug use, hard drug use. That includes um, deaths of infants. That includes uh, suicide. That includes that those are oh, probably uh, yeah like statutory uh, rape. Statutory rape. Um, thing things like that. We will be discussing them. Uh, we will take these things seriously, but they are part of the the events that happen across these series and and we want to talk about them so if any of those things bother you please do feel free to uh turn off now um about 10 minutes in um after mm -hmm. our like like i know it's hard after that ramble i just gave about like the difference between a project when you're the writer of it versus the director of it i know that was compelling but if those things trouble you you really should um turn turn the show off mm -hmm. richard what did you think of Train Spotting, and had you seen it before? Well, oh, sorry, I missed the about... question <laughs> that I put in bold. So, so when I put these episode plans together, I put "What is this film about?" in bold red. It's the only sentence I changed the wow. color of because I don't want to. I've been doing this this way for years as well. I don't want to yeah. forget to ask you what the film is about, and I just ignored it. It's now become so normal that I'm able to look past it and ignore it. What is Train Spotting about? So and train then, spotting, and then what did you think of it? And have you said it before? <laughs> <laughs> so train spotting is about a group of pals, uh, just just a bunch of guys being dudes, really. And part of it is like, I mean, like the whole thing is that like their struggles with addiction, specifically heroin, and it, it, it's almost like these sort of tableaus, and each character has like their own storyline going on and they converge in different ways but uh mm. main character is mark renton played by ewan mcgregor and this was his first real big role um mm -hmm. 
as far as I'm aware. And he his whole thing is that like he wants to get clean for a while and then he's back on and off and and all these things and then i'll, I'll just sort of say the character so we got rent uh rent boy he's also called uh you got spud who's kind of like the real fucking the drop kickiest out of all mm. of them i guess the, you have the, the weakest um, the weakest of the drug addicts <laughs> yeah yeah he's he's like the bumbling sort of um, yeah, 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 most yeah, docile yeah. one um sick boy uh, who's a real like sort of womanizer played by Johnny Lee Miller. And he also, his whole thing in the first one is he knows a lot about James Bond. Mm. And then you've got uh, Tommy, who's like the, the the sort of closest friend with Mark. They're like, you would you say that? They're, they're like- I guess so. he, the, the, the distinguishing f- factor with him is that he's clean. He, he's not an addict. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you have, and then there's also uh, Franco Bigby, who's the wild card. He's very quick to aggression, he ends up getting them in trouble a lot of the time. He's played by Robert Carlyle. And the sort of, it's introduced quite late in the film, but what, uh, it's the kind of thing where it's like, it's, it's only the last like 20 minutes of the film really. But if you finish the film and then you say, Oh, what was it about? And especially coming into the second one, (laughs) it's the thing that they're dealing with the fallout of is that they find these, or they get these big blocks of heroin and they get, um, they get paid $16,000 for it. And then right at the last second, Mark decides to that, any one of these guys would screw him over for the funds. So he's going to take his life into his own hands. He's going to choose life, if you will. Mm. And he runs off with the money. Uh, also, Tommy dies uh, at one point as well. Tommy, Tommy um, uh, gives in and starts doing heroin and dies of AIDS um, yeah. before the end of the film. From, um, um, from so sharing needles. I, yeah, I would say that... Um, that train spotting is about like the the like uh wrecking ball of havoc that is left behind when you introduce heroin into mm. a community right like because mm. um speaking of tommy like a big part of the film is that um renton goes to his house to to borrow or to talk to him about something and finds like the sex tape that Tommy has made with his girlfriend and he steals the sex tape because he's a pervert and then (laughs) Tommy's girlfriend breaks up with him because they can't find the sex tape and that's why he starts trying heroin and that's why he dies right so it's it's, leads to his death yeah yeah yep and you you mentioned here choose choose life so the a big part of and this is i from what i'm the context clues i was given when they revisit this in train spotting mm. too is that this was like some it's sort of like how um on my weed grinder i have a sticker of the deer company the what like drugs drug abuse oh, whatever yeah, yeah, it's yeah. called Which you know like, like proven to not work proven to not work because now people wear it yeah if someone's wearing deer mm. memorabilia you, they're they're into drugs basically is the mm. insinuation i would get right um and uh i think choose life is like an old anti-drug psa that they parody and they and they they have like a cynical look on it um i've got it in front of me do you want me to read it as fast as i can in a scottish accent and you can rate you my it. scottish accent on a scale of yeah of i, I imagine um, nice very good yeah that that the scottish accent's gonna come up a little bit Presumably. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so here is the monologue which opens and closes the film. And I always loved this that when it opens the film, it's it's um Renton, Ewan McGregor being like, look how pathetic the normies are. That this is what they they think is like what life is about. And then closing the film, it's not quite the opposite, but he's he's literally like leaving heroin behind. He's actually to, choosing life. Good book well, because yeah. choose life was a anti suicide um and, ah, and also right. like a pro life. Um, right so here we go here it is choose life choose a job choose a family choose a fucking big television choose washing machines cars compact disc players and electrical tin openers choose good health low cholesterol and dental insurance choose fixed interest mortgage repayments choose a starter home choose your friends choose leisure wear and matching luggage choose a three-piece suit and hire a purchase in a range of fucking fabrics choose diy 
and wondering who the fuck you are on Sunday morning. Choose sitting on the couch watching mind-numbing, spirit-crushing game shows, stuffing fucking junk food into your mouth. Choose rotting away at the end of it all, pitching your last miserable home. Nothing more than the uh, than an embarrassment to the selfish, fucked up brats you've spawned to replace yourself. Choose your future. Choose life. But why would I want to do anything like that? What? Well, yeah, I, I cho- he says, I chose not to cho- choose life. I chose to choose something else. And the reasons, there are no reasons. Who needs reasons when you've got heroin? Which is so well written. I think that's such a <laughs> like like in a like you know you know before going into it, it's like Train Spotting's the heroin movie, and I don't know yeah. why, but I expected them to like dance around that a bit. Like you just see it, or they, <laughs> but it's like no, no, heroin is is my god, and I I, I just I love that monologue. I think it's so well well nice. well when performed we get to the and second well written. Film, I'll mm. do the one from the second one. That's a great idea. Yep, yeah. <laughs> and um, then people can write out. And um, then people can cancel yeah. you because the one in the second film's a bit more problematic. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So, had you seen it before? What do you think of Train Spotting? So I remember. Oh, there's a dead watching... baby in it as well. By the way, that's another yeah, thing yeah. in this wrecking ball is that this this baby in their cracked ends so, just gets um, neglected sick boys and died. Baby, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's a. Yeah, so I remember watching this film, it uh, would have been like my last year of high school, second or last year of high school. And I remember, like, I think my sister quite liked it. it was, um, mm. But I remember. It's an it being Emily one movie. Of, I, I think this is yeah, an Emily is, movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This in like 13. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I remember, like, watching it with some friends, but I, like, I specifically remember not really paying attention to it. Like, it was, it was on at a party type vibes but mm. it wasn't a party it was just like for whatever reason i just remember it being on more than watching it and that's the only time i'd, I'd quote unquote seen it and so yeah i knew that you were a big fan of this movie and i know that there was a period of time in your life where you would have called danny boy or your favorite director partially it's, it's because like of he this was movie and um and 28 days later as well Correct. He he was my first favorite director. When I yeah, started yeah. to like seriously get into film as a teenager, I really loved Twenty Eight Days Later, and f- and so I knew Twenty Eight Days Later. Looked at the director, watched all of his other films because I liked mm. Twenty Eight Days Later. So first first director that I really got like invested and interested in. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. and so yeah, I think I think I am maybe one of those people that's just a a bit put off by the subject matter i mm-hmm. i gave this film four stars i think it's a it's a great movie um but i've i've heard a lot of people you know, in the last couple of weeks talk about it being like a really formative movie for them and i mm. you know just watching it at the wrong time maybe um uh yeah it, it, it didn't resonate with me in the same way that i think it does with other people uh, with me <laughs> having said all that, it's, it's a good movie and but then i think i you know, because that I might be a slight outlier in my feelings of for the second one, um, right? But I, yeah, I mean, I do want to talk. I mean, I, I obviously the um, you've the, the the total softball you laid me up earlier in the week um, when you said, and and you know, this is easy to make fun of you for and i've been making fun of you for it all week but you said well you've been making fun of me all episode as well and making you've we've tried to make each other look like like our our, like stupid right like the the points we're both making why bother making those points i feel like is the energy of this episode but you're about to take it one step further and tell the world that um (laughs) Like you're about to attack my character, not just my intelligence, <laughs> which is important. Yeah, yeah. Continue, yeah, please. yeah. But but because you said to me that uh, you feel like you're yeah, watching Train Spotting because, as I mentioned, you know, formative movie for you, and now revisiting it now for the first time in how many years for you? I reckon the last time I would have seen this was in high school. I reckon eighteen oh, at wow. the oldest was the last time I yeah, would have seen right. this. Yeah, and so revisiting now, you you said to me that. The characters are. How did you phrase it? The characters are going through a lot of the same things, or like you, <laughs> you like, uh, you feel for the. I'm not journey. gonna help you, Richard. You've got to. If you want to, if you want to destroy my person, my like my 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 personhood, you've got to. You've got to keep, bring the evidence uh, to the table. But uh, you you said something along the lines of like the things you're going through, or the things that you like feel where you are in your life, are like a toned down version of. 
the events of this film. So when I watched Train Spotting, because I only watched this um, the other day, every time a character would do a horrific, horrific act, I would like send you a picture of it and be like, "Quote AJ, wow, this guy is literally me." Um, but yeah. I, I do want to talk about this though, about like. Mm. You know, without, you know, as easy as you made it for me to attack your character, I do mm. want to know what you to mean know by that. What and, the fuck what, do you mean, AJ, that, the, that, you're what, like, that you are literally Rent Boy? <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what was it about it that resonated with you? Because I'm sure, you know, the, 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 it's more about, like, the themes of the film than the events of the film. Mm. Um, and like I said, like, it didn't resonate with me in the same way that it cl- clearly does with you and a lot of other people. And I'm curious what that actually is that you're referring to so so here's how i was thinking of it if train spotting is like a 10 my life is a one is a nine <laughs> <laughs> like i i it is not that i am like in remotely the same um situations as these characters but it feels like um, if I were to like dial up the intensity on the problems in my life or the the like vices that I enjoy, it may resemble train spotting. And you, of course, took this to mean that like when Renton <laughs> to mean un- AJ loves heroin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you when Renton unknowingly has sex with a high school girl and doesn't find out till after, you were like, right, because that's what you have done, AJ. And no, of course not. <laughs> but but it's like whatever the if that's a 10 whatever the one the scaled down to one version of that is i feel like that would be something that would happen to me so what do you reckon is the the dialed down version of that situation and it'd be uh, like i don't know um or something like that right which has not they happened to me, just to clarify. <laughs> but okay, but, so that's the, so we're at like a two or a three now. We need to keep dialing. It back. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. AJ, I just wanted to know like the themes that resonated with you. I didn't addiction, addiction, and um, so the biggest thing. So I've got from... a dick on my shin. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest thing for me watching it all these years later is like. When I first saw this movie, I was a devout teen. I was a teenage Christian, you know, like very, very set in stone beliefs that I never thought mm. would change. And so when I saw these characters doing heroin, and they may as well have been like f- magically flying. Like it was something that I saw so beyond what I would right. ever be interested in doing, that it wasn't a relate. It was a cool movie, but it's not a relatable movie. I'm not watching these characters mm. shoot up drugs and being like, oh my God, this is like coming a thousand times at once. I just go like, oh, it's it's the same as if they were to breathe fire or walk on water. Actually, See, I, I probably- get that when I watch... I- <laughs> when I watch um, God's Not Dead, because that's so funny. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually d- would have believed that someone can walk on water, I yeah. guess. Maybe. <laughs> um, but nowadays, I'm a 30-year-old stoner atheist, right? And I, so what What? What I'm saying, it. what I'm saying is I feel like, objectively, I am more likely to do heroin now than I was back then. Right? Yeah, right. I would I'm not interested in doing heroin. Don't worry for me everyone. I'm not pursuing heroin, but I'm saying that the that that it is just more likely like now I've experimented with drugs a bit in the last few years, you know, and so like therefore what used to be a totally closed door is now one that I am responsibly and carefully exploring, right? Mm. And um I don't know. It it's it's it resonated with me in, in a way that scared me a bit because I guess like I understand what heroin does to the brain more now. I understand what like the weed that I smoke does does to the brain. And like, you know, like I guess I'm just saying I could see my I, I could see like if I was in my late twenties in nineteen ninety-six, I reckon like I could have been into heroin. This would have made you want to do heroin. Yeah. <laughs> that I guess I guess that's what I'm saying. Without the proper education or like, you know, like the the stuff I've learned, thank God, because I was born in say a more enlightened time when it comes to these sorts of things, has informed mm, nowadays me. Nowadays we know, know that heroin's bad. We know heroin's <laughs> bad. Um so 
I don't know. Like I, I, um, like my re- my relationship with marijuana is darkly <laughs> reflected. Marijuana is darkly reflected marijuana. by the relationship. Marijuana is darkly <laughs> reflected by the relationship these characters have with heroin, right? Because heroin in train spotting is used as a it's fix all it's multi-purpose right people use it to celebrate they they use it to grieve when the baby dies the mother of the baby she sees renton preparing some heroin to shoot up and she she crawls over to him bawling her eyes out because she's neglected her baby and her baby died and she goes like cook us up a shot rent just really need to like lax out right now like it's a stress relief for her um and mm-hmm. people use it as like like medicinally almost like when he's trying to get off he injects a little bit so that he can um you know like come off it at a slower rate yeah yeah yeah. um and even there's a point in the film where like he is court mandated to give up heroin or else he'll go to prison and that night he celebrates getting it not having to go to prison by shooting up quote one last time right yeah um and this is fairly consistent with <laughs> the the way I use weed as like a stress relief. Now, weed is one hundred times less dangerous than heroin, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to to say that they're comparable. It's just like I understand what drugs are now. And when I first mm. watched this film, it was just this cool, gritty, badass Danny Boyle movie, you know. <laughs> and now it's like, my God, I know people who. I could see getting into these situations or I could, if, like if I t- made like boop and boop, <laughs> um, like, like if I can see that, like if I'd made different decisions in my life, I could end up in a situation not too dissimilar to this, I guess. And I think as well, like Tommy, the character who's clean and then ultimately suffers the worst fate because of it. I saw myself in that as well, you know, like, I don't know. It's it made me no, feel very you're the vulnerable. Bad influence now, dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm the clean I guess one. I'm just saying it, it, it made do, me feel. They're all, they're all you saying they're all the oh, same. no, no mar- marijuana is so different from heroin. It's not AJ. It's all drugs. Wow, wow. Okay, if train spotting is a ten, and my life is a one, what is the movie called? If it's not train spotting, it's like uh, yeah. What's a more looking? boring activity <laughs> than than train spotting? Shoe looking, I sh- shoe watching, looking shoe at gazing. shoes, <laughs> shoe gazing, shoe gazing's the name of my my stoner <laughs> comedy. There you go. Um, but yeah, so that those would like I watched this somewhat stoned as well for this podcast, and th- you know, like for those who don't know, I've moved into a new apartment, um, living by myself for the first time. There are like. I don't know, there's feelings of loneliness that come with that. So I was already feeling kind of down when I chucked it on. And then it's like, my God, should I do heroin? <laughs> is that the answer? Like, I guess, like, this movie is so great because it lures you in by hyping up heroin before, like, I feel like it takes a pretty definitive stance on what heroin can do to a person and so it, it kind yeah, of like think? hits you over the head um yeah. with you know all the things that can go wrong in it yeah it's interesting like because a movie like this you know it, like that it comes out of it and you know i i'm I, I, like to make the point i'm going to make i have to take the the high and mighty stance even mm. you know whether or not it's what i necessarily believe but like that you can be stoned watching this movie and be like fuck you know those guys are bad not me Mm. but like i feel like um conversely the the other sort of big um watch this and you'll swear off drugs movie would be requiem for a dream but Mm. requiem for a dream makes like a specific point of being like no no these are all the same because you have like the storyline with um alan burston where it's like she's addicted to diet pills and she mm. suffers this horrible fate. And it's like, uh, you know, Requiem for a Dream is, if Transporting is about heroin, Requiem for a Dream is about addiction, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's interesting that, 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 you could, that you compartmentalize it as being like, oh, this is a heroin movie, not a drugs movie. Well, I mean, 
I feel not to try and defend myself because I'm very open to like criticisms and things like that. I'm I feel like I'm saying the same thing as you. Like this movie made me want to control my weed habit more. Right. Okay. Like like it made me rethink my behaviors. Like it made me concerned for how how much I use marijuana as a like coping mechanism and something to do and something to help me when i'm stressed out but then also something i use when i'm not stressed out when i'm celebrating when you know like it is it has become just the thing that like i go to when i've got nothing else to do um Mm. and it's very comforting but it's also very dangerous because even though like i'm not going to die from smoking too much weed it's still like it does make you, I guess, more complacent. You can have bad experiences and, more... and shit, yeah. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I'm not into drugs. Like, I I have, like, I, I, I have far too addictive of a personality. Like, I <laughs> am borderline, and maybe not even borderline, like, I'm an addict and... Uh, yeah, when it comes, you know, things and things I maybe don't want to talk about, but I, <laughs> um, but like something like heroin, e- e- even weed is like I know that if I get into this, it's like that literally will ruin my life because I, I have the 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 brain of an addict, and I know mm. that it's like yeah, I just I just cannot. Um, having said that, like fuck, I, mean, I do kind of want to try heroin. <laughs> I like so so heroin as as it's been explained to me is what it does chemically and can I just say to anyone young listening maybe a bit more impressionable without any um ambiguity I am saying never do heroin I am not endorsing mm. heroin I'm going but I'm going to describe what it does to you chemically right is like say you're uh, and I don't know if this is scientifically what it is, but it's how mm. it was explained, like a metaphor used to explain it. It's like, say um, the happy, think of the happiest you've ever been, right? And say on a scale well, to of one- the podcast with you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of On <laughs> one to a hundred, let's say what the happiest you've ever been is, right? Say you, you, you the happiest you've ever felt is like 90%, <laughs> the same as mm. the Rotten Tomato score for this film, right? <laughs> the, the, what heroin, and I think- um, meth does th- is meth no is that the same thing no it's not is it They're different yeah yeah the, what meth does to your brain and what heroin does to your brain is it boosts your dopamine levels or your serotonin levels um inhumanly high right mm. so if you're the happiest you've ever felt was a 90 you you shoot up once you're at a ten thousand, right like mm. it makes you more happy than a human is should be like chemically able to be right and so that's why people get addicted because nothing else comes close to that high like it is it makes you feel well and then also yeah and it takes away yeah it dulls your bill like the the top keeps changing so it's like you know literally chasing that high and then also you are unable to turn on those receptors Mm. without heroin yeah, exactly. And um, also, and a lot of other drugs too, MDMA does this. Um, it, it, you essentially have to think of it like borrowing dopamine from tomorrow mm. because an MDMA come down, Richard, is probably the worst I've felt in my life. That's probably a minus 90% on Rotten Tomatoes is what I felt when I, <laughs> like, and like, you know, just if anyone's worried about me that I'm talking about how many drugs I'm doing at the moment, I probably won't do MDMA again in my life. Like, I found mm. that so... Um, horribly debilitating that i've like kind of been like uh, i don't think i'm an mdma guy you know yeah. um and that's the responsible that's what responsible drug taking i hope looks like i don't know i'm not interested well, in I dying say, i don't I, want to die I just of- just not doing them is the responsible thing well that, that's like um having a no credit score versus a bad credit score it's actually better to have an average credit score than no credit score because it proves that you're good at like that you're at least aware of having to pay stuff back I don't, i've been moving into an apartment everyone's asking me about credit scores and i've just been like there's nothing there do i need I to like I, get a credit card i to- didn't realize um we had credit scores in new zealand <laughs> oh well there you go anyway um 
What are some other moments that resonated with you or that you liked about the first train spotting film? Any any uh, any uh, big moments you want to talk about? The I, I do want to say the 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 dead baby scene is like mm. it the shot like you see the actual um dead baby and it's a horrific sight and it's like mm. it's rendered it's it's like super um like using the uncanny valley um mm. in like a proper artistic way um where it's like you know we, we're we're so used to you see fake babies all the time and you go oh that looks a little bit creepy but it's like yeah that is the point here that it's it's mm. you know um, yeah and then when and then, has like a is with, withdrawing early later in the film the yeah. dead baby crawls along the ceiling and like turns and screeches at him or whatever yeah. or falls but, on it's, it's, yeah. it's it's like a horrific rendered thing also the acting in that scene of everyone's reactions is like that is a, a horrific thing as an actor to try and sell um mm. but i think, I think they, they all well. do it in different yeah. ways that it's like mm. i uh, yeah I, I, there's i hate having to act shocked and 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 horrified um it's just it's, you're such it's, a confident person in real life it's too hard <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like i don't know it's just something that i i feel like um i either can't do it or i overdo it you know mm. and yeah like like, like the the sort of the the sobering realization of the moment is is, is the key thing as well because mm. they are all on you know the fucking most fuck you up drug there is and to have this like brief sobering moment of one of the most horrible things you could see and then how they how they deal with that and you know the the the, the mother screeching for another mm. hit to take it mm. away from her is like yeah mm. yeah no it's it's really hard going um another great monologue in this film though is the um it's shite being scottish and ewan mcgregor goes on about how horrible it is being scottish and like there's something in there about like yeah sure england uh colonizes but we're the dumb fucks that got colonized by you know like so there's a it's, it's such a i think it's such a great speech and it made me think like every country that isn't usa or england should have a train spotting like this mm. movie that's about like the gutter of this, you know, uh, seldom spotlit country. I guess mm. I think it's it's. I would love to. I don't know. For us, maybe it's once, once for warriors. Once for warriors. I guess is, is that one. I, I've never seen once for warriors though, so maybe I should. Well, it's take the kind of film a, where it's like it. this is also a large part of New Zealand. <laughs> like mm, mm, this mm, horrific, yeah. horrific yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, did you know that Kelly McDonald, who uh, plays Diane in the film, this is the high schooler that Renton has mm. sex with without knowing she's a high schooler, um, she invited her mother and brother to set the day she filmed that sex scene. Uh, wow. That was a fun little tidbit. I saw that on when I was looking for dumb IMDb trivia, and I was like, "Is this true?" Because I'm, you can just do whatever you want on IMDb. So yeah. I looked it up, and, I, and there's a whole there. Yeah, she's spoken about it, said that she's like, "Yeah, come along." And then that was the day she filmed her like full frontal nude uh, sex scene with him. She and was it's so funny as well. as well. She was 20 at the time, which copious letterboxed reviews for this film will point out when, mm. <laughs> when they're talking about how hot Kelly McDonald is in this film. Yeah, um, she's a very so, beautiful lady. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, do you have anything else you'd like to say about the first film or should we uh, train on through to the... There are some. There'll be some stuff after we talk about the, the second yeah, film yeah, sure. where it's like the whole franchise in discussion yeah, sure. so t2 train spotting came out in 2017 also directed by danny boyle as richard pointed out it is 21 years later in between this danny boyle has like grown uh instrumentally as a, as a director i feel like he's a very different director now than he was mm. when he made um train spotting him and ewan mcgregor I believe had a falling because he was in like dozens of his yeah. of his films. They had a very public falling out, and then then they like buried the hatchet, and this was like now we can finally make Train Spotting yeah. Two. Um, the, so that sort of it was due to the um he had promised Ewan McGregor the lead role in the beach, and then mm. Leonardo DiCaprio came available, and he shelved mm. him for that, and um yeah that sort of ruined their he friendship. He shelved them just as Rent Boy shelved those uh, 
bundled up wads of heroin uh. before climbing into that disgusting toilet in the first film. Hey, um, but yeah, it's, it's a, I saw an interview with Jane Boyle, I think, on Graham Norton. He talks about making Yesterday. And mm. he says that, like, you know, because of the rights to the music in that film, because it's like the whole Beatles catalog. He says it's the the second most expensive thing he's ever put in a film. Uh, the first was Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> in the beach. <laughs> um, do you know? So first, in film, the beach um, sucks. It's a bad sucks. movie. It's a bad movie. <laughs> Great. Well, let's we'll talk about that a bit in a second, actually. Um, so the first and film also has- like irreparably ruined a, an island in Thailand. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That they've sucks, they've eh? shut it now because it's just like it's so far. I've been there, but they've shut it now. But you've been there. That's yeah, pretty cool. To, yeah, yeah, I've been to the beach that sucks. It's like the beach that makes you old. <laughs> the beach that sucks, which is probably plenty. <laughs> There's probably a lot more beaches that suck than beaches that make you that old. Make you old. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the first film famously has ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes. What do you think T two Train Spotting has? I. It's interesting because I, 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 going into it, I, I had that realization of like I actually don't know what the general public really thinks about this film. Um, I would guess it's like good, not great. I would guess around seventy. It's got eighty-one percent on Ron Tomatoes. Mm. Um, but you hit the nail on the head there. That what is the general reaction? And when I see a sequel, especially a Lego sequel, so a sequel released, mm. you know, a, a reunion sequel, distant um, a sequel, distant yeah. sequel. When I see one get a score that high, it falls into this kind of like very specific gray area of movie criticism. Um, I would put um, Monsters University in the same Mm. camp where it's like standalone. This is a very respectable score for a sequel, especially a sequel to come out years later. But even with that being said, it lives in the shadow of a better film. I guess yeah, it's is nostalgia. That's it's, um, the, yeah, you're a tourist in your own youth. Why? Very good. That's a line from T2 Train Spotting. When what you said T2- that, I was like, AJ. I bet AJ fucking loves that line. Imagine, like, my thought was, imagine being told that that if that mm. was accurate to my life, I, that would devastate me. Being told I'm a tourist in my own youth. What is uh, T2 Train Spotting about? So uh, it's been. Essentially, we'll call it twenty, uh, an even 20 years. It's been 20 years since the events of the last film. The guys haven't seen each other because Renton fucked them all over and um, Big B went into this violent rampage because of being fucked over and ended up in prison. So he's in prison at the start of the film. Um, he, Renton, suffers a heart attack and ends up going, is going through a divorce and stuff. And so ends up having this midlife crisis and goes back to edinburgh Mm. and he ends up re reuniting with uh spud and sick boy and meanwhile so that they have this scheme uh, this get rich quick scheme of um creating a, a brothel essentially and a lot of their film is like you know sick boy says oh, I'm going to fuck him over because he's come back into my life. But then Mm. he doesn't really do anything towards that because you can tell that he actually likes having him back. And um, Spud tries to kill himself, but he gets saved at the last second by by Renton. And meanwhile, Big B escapes from prison. He um, fake, well, he doesn't fake it. He gets stabbed um, and like a planned uh, shanking. And then breaks out of the the hospital and he gets wind that Renton is back in town. He's still this violent, angry person as ever. And so, yeah, you've got like a really clear defined villain in this film that like you have these three guys uh, having this midlife crisis. Um, Meanwhile, hot on their heels, you have this violent, evil fuck that, wants to mm. specifically rent and take him down and um yeah that's that's more or less the plot of the film yeah and it's interesting that you've completely omitted in your description like a key character Veronica, in this film yeah. <laughs> which i think speaks to um what there we need to come up with a term for these kinds of characters these characters who are new additions to legacy franchises often in specifically distant sequels where like so much of the plot hinges on this character 
but it kind of feels weird because it's like, well, they're not even part of like the nostalgia or the 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 mm. legacy of it, you know. And and I think it can work. I think um, I don't know, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, a great example of where like literally mm. the main, but that's literally the main character is a new edition. Mm. Maybe that maybe maybe uh, it would work better when they're the, when they're centered as the main character but it always feels strange when it's like all right well i guess this other character I, I don't know is going to be a a I, crucial part of it yeah i i'm going to be that guy for a moment but the character you're describing more often than not is a woman and again more often than not a woman of color Am I describing that? I didn't know I was describing that. I like You're like, yeah, I, I just th- made that up to attack your character again. Sorry, continue. <laughs> no, I, I just think that like uh and, and you know, I don't want to give any sort of um uh you know you the weight to the or oh, every make everything woke nowadays. But I think there is a lot of movies like Train Spotting where they're like, oh, we'll update it. But you know the mm. the cast is a little dated, um, and mm. but then like you're you have this like core established relationship between all these characters, and so unless it's oh here is the main character, it's like you are slotting someone in. How do they fit into mm. this dynamic that we have? I mean, like the the because the first thing that came to mind was like in um, Jurassic World Dominion. And there's mm-hmm. the bit where you have all the new main characters and all the legacy characters. They're all safe. The only characters you can kill off are the new ones who are both people of color. Mm, correct. That I think what we're, if I may st- attempt to defend your, your like your uh, dead shot to my, the head of my um, character <laughs> right now. Um, I, this is clearly like a problem with writing, though, right? Like, no, yeah, it that, is, I'm saying it's a problem with Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, right. That, um, that in an attempt know, I, to 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 update, um, yeah, th- these things, it's like it, it, I, you could say the heart's in the right place, but it's I, you know, there's also things that um, there's a capitalist agenda to it as well. Yeah, exactly. But but it's just that it's then hard to uh, organically. You know. See, what's great here is I was so terrified you were going to ask me for another um, example of a character, and I couldn't think of a single one. So I'm <laughs> looking it up now. Okay, well, here's some good examples of one. So you've got someone mm. like Furiosa in Mad Max Fury Road. The plot hinges on her, and she's probably the best part of the movie. Um, same with Maria Baklava in Borat 2. I think that that's another positive um, example. Um that was unfortunately the only films that uh, qualified on the letterbox list I just clicked on. Because um, mm-hmm. you know yeah. what I'm talking about, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm describing? Like, these added later characters. You might be right. Maybe it always is like a yeah, like a tricky subject because of why the character's been created in that, in that way. Yeah. I have not seen a lot of legacy. Okay, what about okay, here's here's a safe straight white male example that we can all feel <laughs> comfortable because we can then discuss it as a writing problem and not a um whatever else problem. Uh Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I would say that character is Shia LaBeouf, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Mutt, Mutt Williams is an example where like the a lot of people's problems with that film is like so much hinges on this new guy and who the fuck is he and and why why should mm. we we care or about um him, right? or Phoebe Waller Bridge and um the new one yeah yeah I guess that's also true yeah <laughs> um, all right I'd, I'd never I reckon I'd never been more keen to swiftly move on from a talking point than I have uh, right yeah. now um so. I what what did you think of this? Because because you hadn't seen it before. We discussed last episode that I was like, "This is my most anticipated film of 2017," and then just never watched it until <laughs> yeah. we watched it for this podcast. What did you think of it? Because I I'm going to predict. I I think you're going to. Here's what I think you're going to say, Richard. And I'm so sorry mm. to steal this uh, <laughs> mic drop from you. You're I think sorry. you're going to be like, 
I thought it was just as good as the first one. And you're you're conflicted, Richard, right now because you know that's not that hot of a take. Like it's a hot take. It's it's a little. It's <laughs> like you you turn the shower down a tiny bit, but it's not like you like had to step back because you got scalded by boiling water or anything. Yeah. Danny boiling water. Danny boiling water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I preferred this one. You prefer this one. Okay, we're getting yeah. a little bit... Maybe you like your showers hotter than I do as well. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, and this is why I, I wanted to talk to you to talk about the... Um, it wasn't just to attack your character, but to talk about the... Um, what actually resonated with you in that first one, because I think I maybe resonated a bit more with the characters in, in this film or where they're at in their lives. And... Mm-hmm that are we closer to 46 than 26 no of course we're not of course AJ, that was even fucking ask stupid that. as hell that, that is the so worst stupid. that was recorded <laughs> and you you edit these now so there's no chance of redemption or just not including that <laughs> yeah. but that i i think it's because i'm used to hearing people be like well you're closer to this than this yeah. age and so i was like oh my god without doing the very simple maths in my head am i closer to the age of trade yeah. spotting two than trade spotting one i mean you know the it's been longer now since t2 than the gap between train spotting and t2 feel <laughs> old yet <laughs> 2017 was 20 years ago yeah, yeah wow yet. it's hard to believe it's hard to believe um the the and so I was thinking about this over the last couple of days. Um, and it's like, and I, I, I want to get to the bottom of this together because I, I feel like you're going through what if right now are the best days of my life? Whereas okay. I think I'm going through, I'm pretty sure mine are behind me. Right. I, I don't I wouldn't agree with your uh statement on my life situation necessarily. <laughs> I don't think I don't think um I don't think I'm thinking what what if these are the best days of my life. What I am thinking is how can I make these the best days of my life? Yeah, yeah, think, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah sure. is more what um, I'm doing. Whereas yeah, I think that I struggle a lot more with I I'm pretty sure my best days are behind me. I don't think they are, man. I think we we haven't done enough. Well, in you our don't lives fucking yet. know me, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how fucking sick my early twenties were, bro. Like yeah. I was. <laughs> That's easy for um, you to say. You were you were a devout Christian. Like I, <laughs> I was doing yeah. heroin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I don't know. Just that that um, the I mean the fucking being a uh, a tourist in your own youth i think that mm-hmm. that storyline is yeah I, I think that um is more something that i struggle yeah. with than i then i struggle with heroin um because you know <laughs> i don't i don't i don't struggle with that i've got it under control but yeah the, exactly yeah i don't know i mean like you messaged me the other night being like do you ever think about uh, uh moments that you could go back to and and change things and i was like can AJ, we just acknowledge I, you- that this is a very personal episode we haven't really said we haven't acknowledged how much <laughs> like personal trauma we're all working through that this episode has brought to the surface which <laughs> i would say sincerely is a testament to how well crafted both of these films are in in certain ways well, and also they- how well crafted this podcast is of course <laughs> very but well yeah the, but i was like the yeah, I was like, genuinely, that is, you have hit the nail on the head of, like, my biggest mental health issue is that I spend mm. so long doing that. Um, and mm. I think that that's a big theme in, in T2. I also, from a, uh, you know, more of just a, like, average cinema goer sort of thing, I really like, I, I quite liked the very straightforward villain and the the cat and mouse game um i really like robert carlyle as an actor um he's fantastic mm-hmm. in the first film and, he, and he's great here as well um and yeah i don't know just just i also i think i went into it just really not knowing what to think i i had an i had an expectation because i'd kind of seen the first one before and i knew its legacy but i didn't know anything about the legacy of t2 and so mm. to then be pleasantly surprised i've given them the same score on letterboxd but i 
Yeah, it's I don't cooler know, just to give one. the edge to the um, yeah, 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 to the seldom underdog. picked choice. Yeah, um, I would say this that a lot of what you're describing, you liked about it. I I loved as well. Like I I I all, <laughs> I actually all the liked stuff, it more than you about possibly. It. <laughs> no, I I loved like the tourist in your own youth shit. The whole like the the themes of regret in this film are so palpable, and the kind of like wisdom that can only come from actors and directors who have lived the twenty years that elapses mm. between films, right? Um. I I loved how it started. As the first probably act of this film, I was like, oh, this is so good. This is just as good as Train Spotting. I thought you mentioned it before, um, Big B Robert Carlyle's character, he has to fake a shiving in prison to to escape. That scene te- like it's so it's like it's it, it felt like, okay, so Danny Boyle as the storyteller here has not lost how to tell the the story about this mm. character specifically right because this is such a big b thing to do i loved the scene where so renton is he goes to see spud and we've just seen spud has like tied a plastic bag to his head is he putting like monoxide poisoning in or something or he's no, put he monoxide just in, is he just suffocating and yeah. he like busts through the the, the like broken down door and sees that he's about to die and he's like holy shit he busts in he runs up to spud lifts him up and is trying to take the bag off his head and as he does spud vomits and it's like <laughs> a it's like a, it's like his head explodes because the bag's on his yeah. head so the entire it's like bag in just, um jackass number two yeah the entire bag just <laughs> turns to vomit and it gets all over over renton and i was i loved that that just that idea that that created that, yeah, that yeah. creative idea in that moment because like um, it's true gutter of society imagery, right? It's true mm. fucking rock fucking bottom, right? Mm. Which is what I think the train spotting aesthetic is representing is like, what yeah. does the rockiest of rock bottom look like? And I thought that that evoked that in such a, a, a way that felt really organic to the train spotting legacy. Um, I also loved the, the, the filmmaking in that scene where, um, he sees Spud like because he's got like a hole in the door and he sees him through that and then it cuts to Spud sitting on a chair on top of this high-rise apartment building mm. and then he leans back and you and he cuts to a wide shot and you see him start to fall and then Renton like just slides under and catches him before he hits the and, ground and the stream sequence yeah it's it's very beautiful yeah. it's very beautifully um conveyed isn't it mm. it's with um, Danny Boyle. Yeah, so I really, I really loved that, and I was set to be like, "This is going to be a, a five. Is, I was going to be like, "Is this the best legacy sequel?" Because I think, mm. you know, that's that's still a title. I think that is often up for grabs. I think there are, there are a few great ones, but like more often than not, legacy sequels f- fucking suck, right? I think it's mm. like like they are. I, I the nostalgia terrorism. They go like, "Hey, remember yeah. this? Remember how much you loved this? Maybe you'll love this too because we're reminding you of it by showing you this." Um, and that is how I feel about the t- the second two thirds of this movie, like. I thought it got so much less interesting as it struggled to be its own thing and it would repeatedly like reference things that happened in the first one or show clips of things. There's a mm. moment where Renton is is running down the street and a car pulls out and he like nearly gets hit by it and it's like recreating like a very famous shot from the first mm. film. And I don't mind the, the the reference to it, but then it like cuts to that scene from the first film it, just to be like, see, it's imagery. And it's I, like, yeah, I just hate that I, shit. I, like, I, I, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean, but I do, the, what I got from that moment was <clears throat> less that it's like, as an audience member, you're supposed to go, remember the shot from the first one? It's Renton flashing back to that moment. And then he gets, because after it cuts, right. that he has the smile on his face as if, you know, that thing of like, thinking back to that time and being like fuck you know we i had some good times one thing completely unrelated to this but something i don't know if we've ever discussed is that Mm -hmm. in lost (laughs) when they have the flashbacks like because the the if you haven't seen lost it's like every episode has a tells you a character's um the template of the show is every episode has a different main character and you see flashbacks to that character are the flashbacks what that character is actually thinking about at that moment 
or is it just a is it a um just a storytelling device that's I'm like I'm sure it's God. deliberately not clarified in the show and it's whatever it needs to be in the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I reckon they wouldn't I've, have had yeah. a rule. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I've always I've always thought about cuz there are some moments where it's it seems to be clearly that but then yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. And um, I also didn't like as it goes on, I think it falls into um like there was a point where it was getting towards the end where I go like, that's right. This is what Danny Boyle, this is what a modern Danny Boyle film is like. Mm. Because if you've seen like Trance, it's a real weird movie. And, and like, that's a Danny Boyle movie from maybe like 12 years ago. And the whole thing, mm. like I remember watching it just being like, why did Danny Boyle want to make this movie? It's It yeah, felt yeah. so like, like boring and, and nothing. And like, I, um, you said you liked the straightforward bad guy revenge shit mm. i didn't i was like this is now feels feels like like i love how genreless train spotting one feels it doesn't feel mm. like it's conforming to a set of tropes or conventions whereas now like the ver- the ending of train spotting 2 t2 train spotting is very much like a thriller like they're in an abandoned mm. house and bigby's chasing him and and um it also has uh the the classic Danny Boyle trippy sequence at the start of the third act. Um, and mm. these, so, y- yesterday, I can't remember what in yesterday, but so many of his films, the third act, it just gets real cerebral and, and buzzy mm. and weird. There's the bit and- in yesterday where he's like standing in a room watching all the mm. like social media comments pour in, which is also but Maybe that's in, the equivalent, um, yeah. And uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. <laughs> breaks the Internet, yeah. Um, and I think that uh, this trademark trippy sequence at the start of the third act, I can't tell you why. Sometimes it's the best part of the movie. Sometimes <laughs> it ruins the movie. The In the beach, it sucks. It, it oh turns my God, the video game into, sequence? The, the video game. It's, it's so, so stupid. And I wouldn't say I was enjoying the beach up to that point. But you get to that point and it's just like... I don't. This is like detracting. This is not adding, at least from as me as an audience member. I don't feel like I'm like getting anything out of this. Whereas, like in Twenty Eight Days Later, it's it's ghostly and it's like essential Mm. to the movie being as like iconic and memorable as it is. When he's like, it's it's him. It's uh, uh, Killian Murphy essentially going crazy trying to like save his friends. And it's great. And in Train Spotting One, it's the it's the withdrawal sequence. So it actually has like a plot reason mm. as well, I guess, in Train Spotting One. Yeah. And um, Steve and, and, Jobs, where it's like the same where it oh, fuck, that's a good movie. Steve Jobs where is great, yep. Steve Jobs is fucking good. Like if you're mm. like, oh, it's just a stupid biopic, I don't care. It's great. And but you're the scene where he's like arguing and it's like it flashes back a bunch of times. It's like uh, why mm. did you the why did you fire me scene? Mm. with um jeff Dan- fuck it's good mm. yeah anyway. so <laughs> in this it, that that when it got trippy and cerebral and shit i was just kind of like i don't know i think i like it when it's motivated and it didn't feel motivated in t2 whereas it does in 28 days later and train spotting and um slumdog millionaire as well another f- i fucking love slumdog millionaire so much and like <laughs> that to me is like that that to me was like the last time I like went to a Danny Boyle film and was like, it's my favorite director was Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah. I think so. And you, but you fell off for 127 hours. I do like 127 hours. It's not as good as Slumdog Millionaire, but the the trippy sequence at the start of the third act, the 127 hours, yeah, yeah. which is so funny because how reliable it is that he does this in every movie. Yeah, it's yeah, great yeah. in 127 hours. I think. I but again, motivated, right? He's literally yeah. losing his mind. The the if yeah. a different director made that movie, you would still need to include that. Yeah, yeah that sure. cerebral sequence. Um, yeah, I do think though. I'm happy to talk about like what is good about this film. And the main thing I, I had think, especially in that first section where I was actually really, really enjoying it is like our Lego sequels better when they're following up movies that like never even remotely asked for a sequel in the yeah. first place, like train spotting than when they're star Wars, Indiana Jones, whatever, where it's like a sequel is kind of built into the DNA of the, yeah, yeah. the movie in the first place, because this so this is I'm about to say another Lego sequel that is not critically well received. I actually think it's one of the like strongest at what it's doing uh, is American Reunion. 
Oh. <laughs> what did you say? Zoolander 2. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, so I think bad. I, American Reunion, the American Pie legacy sequel, I think mm. it's like if you like American Pie, I guess, is the caveat, mm. which is a very big caveat, I understand. Like, I think it services the franchise in a very satisfying way. Um, no pun intended. Um, and uh, and the, I think the best example of what I'm talking about is the Before trilogy, right? Like, like mm. that is an example where, like, I wouldn't say they don't ask for sequels, but they stand alone. There is part of you that feels like this would be ruined if I saw any more than what it's showing me. But each sequel in the Before trilogy is like has its place and belongs, mm. you know. Anchorman um, Two. Anchorman Two is it has a better critical score on Rotten Tomatoes than Anchorman One. And that is also a movie. I guess that's not a movie that doesn't ask for a sequel, but they made a big point about not doing one for so long. Um, I and of course the, the exception to every rule, Blade Runner twenty forty nine is like so good, and that's not. Better I wouldn't than the say original, Blade one Runner one of the best films ever made. Yeah, I wouldn't say Blade Runner one is is not asking for a sequel. I think it probably yeah, was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I found this uh, review uh, on Letterboxd for T two Train Spotting. Um, that's essentially a riff on the choose life monologue. Now you mm. said before, do you like you'll do the second movies one, and then I'll read this like review that I think when it would have come out in twenty seventeen, yeah, January nineteenth, twenty seventeen, this would have been like this. It's like a way to critic- critically assess the film while mm. also like engaging with its famous monologue. Yeah. So what is the T will- two choose life monologue? Well, so I will say as well about this because I, I, um, I, I think I remember the trailer for this film because I remember the choose Twitter, um, yeah. But then I also might be conflating that with um, in Broadchurch with David Tennant's like bloody Twitter, who told the journalist? <laughs> um, and but I, I, so I remember that being in the trailer, and then when he started doing it in the movie, I was like. Ah. Like, because <laughs> well, it, it, feels- cu- it, it cuts to very yeah. obvious ADR as well, that, like, he is in a, you know, because in the first one, it's just voiceover. In this in this film, um, he's on a date with um, Veronica, the new character we talked about, and she says, what does choose life mean? Because Sick Boy mentions it sometimes, and he explains the mm. concept. And um, But it it's, feels it's, very... It's, it's very uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it insists upon itself. It's, it's, it insists it's upon drawing itself. attention to something that was so good in the first one, and it's yeah. literally saying, "Wasn't this great?" Here's an updated version, everybody. Yeah. Which, which I, which is great for a trailer um, mm. in the film. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. so she, he, she says, "What's choose life?" And he says, "What?" She says, "Choose life." Simon says it sometimes. He says, "Choose life, Veronica." <clears throat> <clears throat> Channel my mother here. Um, your mother Choose is life. Scottish. Your mother is not Ewan McGregor, just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Choose Life was a well-meaning slogan from a 1980s anti-drug campaign, and we used to add things to it. So I might say, for example, choose designer lingerie in the vain hope of kicking some life back into a dead relationship. Choose handbags, choose high-heeled shoes, cashmere and silk to make yourself feel what passes for happy. Choose an iPhone made in China by a woman who jumped out of a window and stick it in the pocket of your jacket, fresh from a South Asian fire trap. Choose Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, and a thousand other ways to spew your bile across people you've never met. Choose updating your profile. Tell the world what you had for breakfast and hope that someone somewhere cares. Choose looking up old flames, desperate to believe that you don't look as bad as they do. Choose live blogging from your first wank to your last breath. Human interaction reduced to nothing more than data. Choose 10 things you never knew about celebrities who have had surgery. Choose screaming about abortion. Choose rape jokes, slut shaming, revenge porn, and an endless tide of depressing misogyny. Choose 9-11 never happened, and if it did, it was the Jews. Choose a zero-hour contract and a two-hour journey to work. And choose the same for your kids, only worse. Maybe tell yourself that it's better that they never happened. Then sit back and smother the pain with an unknown dose of an unknown drug made in somebody's fucking kitchen. Choose unfulfilled promise and wishing you'd done it all differently. Choose never learning from your mistakes. Choose watching history repeat itself. Choose the slow reconciliation towards what you can get rather than what you always hoped for. 
set off a lesson, keep a brave face on it, choose disappointment and choose losing the ones you love. And then as they fall from view, a piece of you dies until you can see that one day in the future, piece by piece, they'll all be gone and there'll be nothing left of you to call alive or dead. Choose your future, Veronica. Choose life. So, well done. Very good. Uh, much better Scottish accent than me. What I Thank think you. is flawed about <laughs> this is that in train spotting, when the characters are talking to each other, it is it feels very unrehearsed. It feels like mm. so grounded, right? Whereas like the theatricality is allowed in the first film because it's his voiceover and that's allowed to be whatever it wants. And he only says when he says it in real life, it sounds so rehearsed that if I was Veronica in that situation, I'd be like, Okay, you had this prepared? You've clearly the yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> Um, so this this is the most popular review for T2 Train Spotting by Christopher Preston on Letterboxd. Um, I'm not going to do the accent. I'll, I'll read through it pretty quick because I, I just think it's a fun, like, uh, it's a way, it's it's like a, I assume Danny Boyle doesn't know about meme culture as much mm. as this person does. And so it's, it's a more like closer to street level choose life um, monologue. Mm-hmm. Choose life, choose memories, choose escapism, choose memes of Arthur and SpongeBob and Hey Arnold and anything else that briefly reminds you of sitting in front of CBBC after school with a bag of space raiders. Choose 80s music and 90s kids. Choose time hops and throwbacks. Choose prequels, paracles, sequels. Choose reboots, remixes, reimagining. Choose re-releases, re Sets, reunions choose live action versions choose to awaken the force choose anthology stories choose cgi faces of people you're pretty sure died 20 odd years ago choose playing down slowed soft piano versions of original john williams scores over trailers choose la la land choose dwayne johnson choose solo decker and indy choose the power rangers choose batman and superman choose spider-man choose spider-man choose spider-man choose dumb and dumber and legacy and G- Genesis and Creed and Covenant and The Hobbits Part 1 and 2 and 3. Choose Finding Dory, The Incredibles 2, Cars 3, Toy Story 4. Choose the original cast, original director, choices from the original soundtrack. Choose nods, choose winks, choose grins, choose nostalgia because it's your best friend. It's your only friend. Choose your future. Choose life. Fuck, that's so good. (laughs) It's so like, like, I don't know, like that's... That's the podcast, right? Like that's Cole Popship. Mm. That's we the choose life podcast. That yeah, just that whole T two train uh, spotting should have been called that. There you go, <laughs> Rivix. Um, can we talk about titles, AJ? We can. Um, I would you. What well, of the worst all- titles of all time? <laughs> we, we could talk about um a, a and in fact it's great that you've already segued because now this is a truly poorly placed useless statistic <laughs> that i can throw at you for train spotting um, which is uh train spotting is our fourth franchise and we can have fun with this you can pick it apart and we can try assemble a more fun one from this train spotting is our fourth franchise wherein the sequel title takes the first significant letter of the first film's title adds a two after it and then a subtitle can you think of the other ones i'm talking about <laughs> so it's uh, it's letter two subtitle but uh, not officially called that but t2 is most commonly refers to terminator T2 Judgment Day is, is an accepted title yeah. of Terminator yeah. 2. Uh, we've also got um, X2, often called X-Men United, or X2 yeah. X-Men United, um, and D2 The Mighty Ducks, and there's also yeah, D3 course, The nice. Mighty Ducks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is an interesting case because like, if you're applying the same rule to Mighty Ducks, it's like, yeah, I guess D... I guess D would be the letter you'd pick to put mm, a number after. Cause no. not, but yeah, I, like... It's only I, I'm only familiar because those movies are thirty years old, you know. Like if mm. that came out now, I'd be like, I don't think of Mighty Ducks as D, you know. Like Terminator's <laughs> yeah. one word, I can understand that. Yeah, well, um, it, like Train Spotting isn't my go-to T. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, in the case of both Train Spotting and the Mighty Ducks, the subtitle as well is just the name of the franchise. So T two mm. Train Spotting, D two the Mighty Ducks. Um, for extra stats, you could chuck an F nine the Fast Saga in oh, there, yes. um, which is not the same thing as what I said because it's I was specifically talking about twos, but this is essentially the same thing it's significant letter number subtitle that is just the name of the series Hmm. um and also uh 
I, I thought this was interesting. So H20, the the 20 year yeah. Halloween movie. Do you know what the actual title of H20 is? Because I didn't know this till I was looking this up to make sure I got the name right. Like, what H- is the the registered title for the that Halloween movie? Uh, Halloween H two O. Close. It's Halloween H twenty colon twenty years later. Yeah, yeah. Isn't yeah, isn't that? How does that make it to cinemas? That yeah, title. Yeah. You know. Halloween H anyway, twenty just add water. <laughs> We, I guess this is a good segue to talking about titles broadly because, boy, are we in an interesting interesting episode to talk about titles because the film ti- the first film, Train Spotting, is not said aloud in that film. It mm. is not even really like referenced. The the so to mm. train spot to it's like bird watching, I guess, like watching trains yeah. go by. That there, there are trains in Train Spotting, but at no point does someone is someone like watching a train it doesn't appear to have any thematic significance to the story itself i'm quite surprised the movie wasn't retitled from the novel yeah it's Um, because but there's like in the second one there's a a flashback to the first film kind of yeah where that title is said which is a scene from the novel so right, yeah, and I fair. I didn't like that. I thought it's like yeah, <laughs> just I I thought, just you, I thought you wouldn't. It's like no. the thing where if if that scene was in the first film, be great. You would you would love the title because you love titles where it's like just a thing someone says. Yeah, but exactly. the um, but you know that the fun fact about the um the Gallagher brothers, one of them or both or Oasis, were asked to make a song for Train Spotting, and he was like, "That sounds boring as fuck." Hmm. Like just the word, and so he was like, "Yeah, I didn't fucking no, no one told me. I didn't know who Irvin Welsh was. I didn't yeah, know any exactly. of this shit. Um, I just thought, oh, it's a documentary about trains, and not fucking writing a song for that. Ah, uh, it's it's a it's not a like I like this. It's, it's not that I think the title it should have a different title. I think they should have worked it into the first film because they mm. put it in the second one so clearly there's like some reverence mm. for that that scene which for those who haven't seen either film there is a flashback in train spotting 2 where bigby's estranged father um asks is like grilling them on where they've been and asks them if they've been train spotting so i guess we could infer then that like if train spotting is what an old person thinks young people are doing, the significance of the title is that young people are actually shooting up heroin. Mm, it's like, right. that's what, if you say you're train spotting, perhaps you're actually shooting yeah. up um, heroin. Uh, T2, train spotting. T- talk to me. Why, what do you think? You said this is the worst so, title a movie's ever had. <laughs> <laughs> like, is it supposed to be that T2 sounds like a train line? Never thought of that. And even so, you've abandoned the train imagery from the fucking movie. So, <laughs> like, it doesn't, yeah. you can't feed I, it back in there. Yeah, I just think that T2 train spotting, terrible title. It's terrible is because of what you said before, which is like, I don't call the first one T. I don't think of it as like yeah. T, the movie. Well, um, also, according- there's already T2. T2 is Terminator 2. So, according to Danny Boyle, when asked about this, which is amazing whenever... You, like, it is shockingly rare to hear a director talk about when a sequel has a weird title. Yeah. Like, it, <laughs> it doesn't come up nearly as much as it should. But Danny Boyle has commented on this, and he said that it feels like it's what the characters themselves would have called the movie, uh, which is a fascinating approach to titling yeah, a film, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. And not one I hate. I think it's a bad title, but I don't... Don't hate the reason. It works for something like sense. Bill and Ted. Yeah, right. But not for if that was called T uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I feel like you know, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. That's what they would call it. But like, mm. and, 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 you know, the, Bill and Ted are cool dudes. They use some problematic language from time to time. But they're guys that we could be like, yeah. Well, what would you guys name the film? But it's like, why would you ask these junkies what to name? The sequel to and their anything, life. And if anything, shouldn't it be like a 007 reference? Because that's the main cultural, yeah, pop yeah. cultural, like, touchstone in these movies. Um, well, the apparently, anyway. yeah, that's true. Um, James Cameron, the director of Terminator 2, uh, is on the record as being fine with it, unquote. Uh, he was like, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever. <laughs> he said they're, yeah. they're 26 years too late, but if it's just a cheeky, cheeky wink, I don't care. Yeah, nice. Same. 
Um, so one thing we like to do on the show, uh, Richard, is when we're covering a franchise that's based on a book, uh, we actually like to draw some comparisons between um, the the movie adaptation and the original novel. And when I say we, I don't mean you and me. I am, of course, referring to uh, Laziest Pig on the Farm and fucking dopey junkie cunt. Uh, I'll fucking rip your fucking open and feed any er uh, fucking miserable sick grey junkie flesh aka our intern Rachel who uh, said I believe in you when she gave me that introduction uh, earlier today nice. um, They so I don't know I'll ask I'll check with Rachel after recording if, if they're okay with me saying this they're very sick this week so uh, work was limited but they've they've said they'll post a full a full list in our discord um, once they're feeling mm. a bit better but we do have a couple of pretty fucking interesting changes from the novel to the film here so in the film <laughs> uh, Renton is the is the narrator main character and main focus in the novel each chapter is is narrated either by a, a, thir- a third person perspective or a different character so um, sick boy ha- has mm. It like narrates chapters about him. Um, there's a character in the in the novel called Second Prize, um, who is narrates a chapter, and characters even outside the main friend group narrate parts of the book. Um, while there is some surrealism to the novel, given the states of its protagonists and honestly just how ri- it's written or narrated, some of the most famous scenes were heightened or changed for the movie. Um, and Rachel said in a way that I think is actually clever and takes advantage of the two being different forms of media. While Mark does have a big uh, mm. dig, has, he has to dig out suppositories in a shitty toilet. Um, in the novel, this is just, that's literally what he's doing. Whereas in the movie, he like crawls inside the toilet and swims through this, you know. Yeah, yeah, Probably yeah. the most famous scene <clears throat> um, from the movie. The worst toilet in Scotland. It like has yeah, its own little toilet. Yeah, yeah, the worst toilet in scene. Scotland, yeah. Um, in the novel, Mark hallucinates Baby Dawn, the, the dead baby on the ceiling. But in the book, the baby talks to him and yells a string of insults and threats and accuses him of letting her die. Um... Rachel says that the way it's created, the the way it's written creates a strong impact, but would probably be too goofy if filmed, which is, a, I think that's a great observation on the difference mm. between the written word and the filmed word, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And f- oh, it's like in the Hunger Games when they have the like um, the dogs that come after them are supposed yeah, to have the yeah, faces yeah. of the other tributes, where it's like that's horrifying in a book, yeah. in a movie, probably. Uh, like the numbers so. of the number of characters is heavily cut down for the film, and the events are streamlined. Notable character omissions include second prize mentioned before, who's an alcoholic friend of the group, Matty, whose death by toxoplasmosis is given to Tommy in the film. Um, Tommy has an impending death implied in the novel, but it isn't shown. Uh, and Mark also has Billy and Davy, uh, his brothers, who are both dead as well. Um, and finally, Diane is 14 in the novel, not um, barely legal as she is in the <laughs> film. Uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of these decisions make sense <laughs> for why they were changed oh, yeah. for the for it. Um, yeah. Rachel did, uh, did yeah. not uh, dive into the sequels to the novel, but I can talk about them now as we mosey on and to continue the franchise. Uh, there are no plans for a third train spotting movie, but the novel, as you said before, has a few sequels, um, or at least it depends, you know, the term sequel, I think. Has has can be stretched for some of these stories set in the same universe as Train Spotting is what it sounds like. Um, Porno released in two thousand two, but was later retitled to T two Train Spotting after T two Train Spotting came out. Um, that's a, that's a that's a direct sequel to the Train Spotting novel. From what I understand, though, T two is very loosely based on Porno, so much so that the titular pornography subplot is not even in T2 train spotting like the 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 wikipedia says that porno treats porn the way the first one treats heroin so it's like the first one's about heroin the second one's right. about porn and that does not at all read in the the movie version should have just called the first film heroin okay. Book, There's also you know, a prequel released in 2012 called Skag Boys, which tells the story of how the fir- how the gang first got into heroin. Um, and finally, Skag being a um, 
street term for heroin. Yep. And finally, the Blade Artist, which is a so not finally though there is a there is a another book called the Blade Artist, which is a spin off novel which follows Begbie in modern day. In 2021, Robert Carlyle announced he would be reprising Begbie in a TV miniseries based off. The Blade Artist, uh, and as recently as 2023, oh. has confirmed it's six episodes and it's still happening apparently. Um, so that's kind of interesting that like, oh, cool. I didn't the, know about that. Yeah. yeah, the spirit of of Train Spotting as a movie, you know, live action adaptation is yeah. like still in, in flux. Yeah, Robert Carlyle is great. Mm, he's so good. Uh, finally, a full blown third se- third sequel novel called Dead Men's Trousers was released in 2018. So after T2, and it sounds like it has a very similar plot to T2. It's about Renton, Sick Boy, and mm. Spud reconnecting as middle aged men. Uh, it d- it is not very well received. I read it's, it. Kind of. Yeah, because I, I think the 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 age gap, the time gap between transporting and porno, like in in world, isn't very much, is it? Mm. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. Yeah. It's not as much. Yeah. So, what is your continue the franchise, Richard? How would you like to see train spotting um, exist in the world today? Uh, uh, I don't know. I think there's like uh, I I would like to see like an alternate version of T two mm-hmm. where I feel I mean because you could just do obviously a straight adaptation of porno or that other um, one, but I yeah I'd like you could. Like, what if Renton... Because it's it's all these things about, like, you know, thinking back to your past that, like, what if things had gone differently? Um, what if Renton didn't steal the money? Mm. And then we get a 20 years later sequel based on alternate events. That's a cool idea. I mean, I guess that's just the um, ignores all sequels sequel in a way. Just you rarely yeah. see that happen for a, a franchise that's only yeah, got two Ignoring the last five minutes of the film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I my approach to this was like, this would have been such an icon for the youth in Edinburgh. Edinburgh at the, is that how you say it? Edinburgh? Edinburgh? Edinburgh. Edinburgh um, at the time, right? And for all the wrong reasons, I imagine this was very much like a Fight Club situation where it, it like teenagers would have been like, "Fuck yeah, these characters are awesome," and then base their yeah, lives yeah. around or like skins. Yeah, exactly. Um, and but what I think it feels like it's it's ripe for is, and this is I apologize, this is very much like a a um, continue the franchise format I keep in my drawer. Uh, train spotting the animated series. Train spotting in space. Train spotting in oh. sp- space spotting. No. Um, <laughs> train spotting the. Ani- train spacing. <laughs> train spotting the animated series feels like it's um, it's one of these things I'm kind of surprised didn't happen in the first place. I I imagine if this <laughs> actually happened, it would be similar to like that seldom seen clerks animated series yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say um, clerks, which yeah. is famous for its second episode being a clip show um which i think is such a funny like little blip in like the history of interesting <laughs> tv um uh, moments um but for extra points how do you make a train spotting animated series that's a saturday morning cartoon for kids you know because like ace ventura had a saturday morning cartoon for kids and that's not exactly it's not as brutal as train spotting but like Mm. you know could you do one where like they're addicted to sugar they're a bunch of sugar junkies and there's a wacky baby that crawls around their sugar you know what i mean like like i always enjoy and we've talked about this wacky baby it's called wacky baby and and we talked w2 wacky baby (laughs) we talked about this when (laughs) (laughs) when when, um when Lightyear came out because it was a similar thing how people were saying that the buzz Lightyear animated series is like the the series that was made based on Lightyear, which is the movie that came out in the Toy Story mm. universe and all this bullshit that they really needed to make abundantly clear for people to understand it. It's like it's the same <laughs> thing where it's like, okay, so take the plot of train spotting. How do you dilute this? Maybe maybe Richard, what I'm actually talking about is what is the one to train spotting's ten again? Maybe I'm asking for my life to be yeah, depicted right, yeah, yeah. as a train spotting. You're just pitching series. stubble at <laughs> Alrighty, so that is Content the Franchise. We are now going to move on to Ranked at Franchise. So on our uh, letterboxed, we have a little list called FFF Ranking where we rank the different franchises we've watched. Um, what do you think? What are you thinking with Train Spotting? Where is Train Spotting's place? the best place? franchise we've covered. Straight to number one, okay. Um above all right now we just have to reveal our next <laughs> um <laughs> let's i reckon let's put it um 
We we I'm gonna throw out a, a franchise to you, and you're you're gonna sure. tell me if you think it's better or worse than the Train Spotting movies. Uh, Child's Play is Child's Play slash Chucky better than the Train Spotting? I reckon it's identical in quality. <laughs> you never want to do this. Genuinely, should we just stop ranking the franchise? <laughs> because I feel like your heart's um, not in it anymore, which is fine. I couldn't give a shit. I'm not like calling you out for it. But like, I don't know. Is this just not? Is there no point to doing this anymore? I uh, I don't know. The fans love it. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. Because it's one of these interesting things where it's like, is it? I I've read it. I like both of these films, and I think that it's a surprisingly strong sequel. I agree. But is it a good franchise? Um, I think it's it's because because we kind of there's a there's a ceiling to two film franchises. That's true. Yeah, I agree. So the currently the highest ranking two film franchise we've got is. Whew, it takes a while to get to any of them. Um. Clyde with a chance of meatballs. Is it really? What's that at? 29. Okay. So do you think that Train Spotting and Train Spotting 2 are better than Cloudy with a chance of meatballs? I think they're better than Child's Play. <laughs> well, Child's <laughs> Play is, is. I think you're misremembering how well Child's Play works as a franchise specifically, in spite of the quali- quality of the, maybe the movies themselves, right? Yeah. Like. I respect Child's Play a lot for just like grinning and bearing it through eight movies mm. in a way that actually has some cohesion to it, right? It is a good franchise yeah. comprised of like three out of five movies. <laughs> yeah. Um, I reckon, what about if we go, um, I, I think Cloudy with a Chance of Meeples is probably overall more solid than... Um, Actually, how about this? How about we put it at 30 in between Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Cloudy with a Chance of Meeples, which is yeah, just now above... That, um, now that getting to the Greek is real problematic. Yeah, yeah. It's it, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, by the way, is one above Monsters, Inc. So we now have four two-film franchises in a row. Um, so let's which is, I think is deliberate. Save it there at number 30. And if th- those we have people in our Discord who like try to guess where we rank them, which is the funniest game. Like I always find... like guessing numbers is such a funny way to find well, it's also like that they care about the segment so much more than we do <laughs> yeah. um but it is start i wonder if there's a um trick to it now that they'll look at at, at other two film franchises and go yeah, like yeah, well yeah. it's probably gonna fall around here which not a bad strategy honestly little little tip for you yeah. there uh, all right, Richard, now we've just got to select what the next franchise that we're going to cover is. And the way we're doing that is that every second franchise is selected by our patrons over at patreon.com slash uh, uh, um, where you can s- vote on and suggest which franchise we cover every second episode. Richard, do you want to tell me what's going on over there? Last I saw it yep. was a tie. So, yeah, the tie's broken. Um it's all going to be, I, I until we've done all of the ones that are currently in contention, I think it's going to be pretty similar um, for most of the year. But we're going from rank debt franchise to crank debt franchise. We're oh, debt franchise. Fortnite. <laughs> Great. So, so <laughs> glad that we can go from um, one movie, movie franchise with like very troubling uh outdated problematic sexual depictions to something like crank which is just a fun time there's nothing you know there's nothing yeah, yeah. we're not going to watch crank it, so. and be like jesus christ there is uh <laughs> there is something we all need to sit down and talk there about. is jason Bourne. <laughs> there is jason statham actually there there are going <laughs> to be people who didn't get your joke there and think you mixed up Jason Bourne with Jason <laughs> And for, because I love you so much and I know how much you would hate people to think you had a Freudian slip like that, Richard knows what he's doing. Do not fucking doubt Richard's <laughs> references, okay? I've never, I'm not kidding. My references are out of control. I've never heard Richard make a mistake when referencing an actor <laughs> or a movie. It's never happened. <laughs> Uh, all right, we'll Thank tune you. in next week for next franchise, next fortnight for the two crank films, Crank and Crank High Voltage. Another um, and Crank Dead Soldier Boy. Another another franchise which was very much like 
part of my life the same time that train spotting was. So and I can't be... wait to dig into how and why, AJ. <laughs> Just save it. Jesus Christ, AJ. Let's end the episode. <laughs> um, stay tuned for the post credit scene after this music ends and also follow us on Instagram and Twitter and all, that, all those places. J- jump in the disc. The Discord's the main place where you can chat to us. So jump in there and tell us um, what your thoughts are on drug addiction and trade spotting and... Um, whether or not the characters in Lost are recalling or if we're being objectively shown (laughs) the events of the past Um, let us know what you think uh, and we'll be back next fortnight with a bloody uh, with with a bloody uh, uh, Jason Statham uh, vehicle in in the Crank franchise from from Scottish to English nice who was that supposed to be (laughs) your fucking your fucking mum Richard (laughs) (laughs) Welcome along to the post credit scene. This is a sequence at the end of each episode. If you donate $5 or more over at patreon.com slash coldpopshire, you get to give us some to talk about in this is the post credit scene. Richard, can you tell me what it is and who it's from this week? Today's comes to us from Jake, who says, are there any franchises that you refuse to do? If so, what are they and why? Have we not fucking been asked this a thousand times? I refuse to do the franchise... Shawshank Redemption, because mm-hmm. I don't personally... I know you do, AJ, famously, yeah. but I don't consider it a franchise. I I would say in my personal um, like philosophical approach to this podcast, probably not. There's probably... Like, I guess, like, like, this, like, outsider art is maybe a different conversation. Like, I think, like, I probably wouldn't really, like... I don't know. I don't really want to do Neil Breen. Right, like I don't really want to like mm. delve into like a certain uh, quality of film well, also, that yeah. has. There's shit of like the fucking Mr. Plinkett as well. There's like a movie there that like people are like these technically count, and it's like, do you have actually have any interest in us doing these, or do you just want us to know that you know this exists? <laughs> um, yeah. Which is it, it, it comes up so frequently. Um, I would say, like I've I've said, I don't want to do Saw. I I, I know that, like, and I that's just, a big one. I, zero interest in watching those movies, which is a big franchise. This year, though, very similar vein. I'm not doing Hostel. <laughs> Why is that coming up? Because it's it's a two from franchise. Ah, is it really? Uh yeah, I probably wouldn't be that keen to do Hostel. I, I think so. It's Hostel two. I'll I'll look up if Hostel's two films, and then we can we can go. So and you can not suggest. The, okay, this is just telling me hostels in my area that I could. Hostel stay in. Part Three came out in two thousand eleven. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. So after yeah. after well, they de- then we're definitely not doing it this year. If if after I just like gave you such a like um, praising before of never getting a c- pop cultural reference wrong, <laughs> you come out and be like, yeah, you know how there's only two hostel movies. Jesus Christ, Richard, you do a f- podcast about franchises. Get it together, man. Wow. Okay, it wasn't Eli Roth though. He didn't do the third one. I don't. I don't recognize it as an official entry. <laughs> like what people do with like, good thing that they never made Matrix sequels. I'm like, damn, good thing um, Scott Spiegel never made a Hostel three, <laughs> and we've got and we've got two perfect movies by two Eli perfect Roth, though, movies that you watched. refuse to watch. <laughs> <laughs>